Welcome again to the Practical Enneagram. Psychotherapist and couples counsellor Rosemary Cowan supports couples in working through their relationship challenges, drawing on the Enneagram as one of her tools. Rosemary, who is also a qualified practitioner and teacher of the Enneagram, played an integral role in getting the narrative Enneagram training here in the UK. She's speaking on relationship as a spiritual journey at the upcoming Enneafest taking place on the 9th and 10th of April in Birmingham. UK people do see whether you can attend. I've put the information in the episode notes. The Enneagram and Enneagram theory is very much in the background of this cosy chat I had with Rosemary, whose brain I was more about picking on how to have a healthy relationship that lasts. I have found the Enneagram to be profoundly useful in all of my relationships. The Enneagram sets you up to observe patterns you wouldn't otherwise be able to see. And a person who is in the habit of reflecting on their reactivity, being aware of it, is inherently easier and safer to be in relationship with. I think we also tend to be inhabiting a larger proportion of reality. The secondary major benefit has been how easy it is to reach a more generous interpretation of other people's behaviours now that I have the Enneagram. It's tough to imagine how I'd have managed this to the extent that I have without it. I still get annoyed by people, but the Enneagram makes it easy to get back to love. I had hoped to draw Rosemary on conflict styles and object relations, but she felt we wouldn't be able to have a meaningful conversation about those aspects in the time given the other questions I wanted to ask. I know that for me frustration is more the overall tone of me than something that specifically surfaces in relationships. I was not surprised that Rosemary highlighted the instincts as being a very key aspect of the Enneagram when it comes to relationships. Having lived through an experience with a partner who was dominant in an instinct that I am blind in creates a lot of challenge and, um, well, opportunity actually. Thank you to Angela Scott for helping to facilitate this interview. I hope that you enjoy. relationships which is a big topic so before we get to it Mm. I would love to hear about you and your work in the world with the Enneagram. Okay I first met the Enneagram in 1997 Mm. when my husband and I were in a tricky place Mm. in our relationship. We had been married for nearly 20 years and um, well we each thought the other one was a bit mad I think. (laughs) Uh, I'm a six he has type three much as there are, you know, there's there's complementarity, but there's also we're each other's stress and relaxation points. Yeah, there were were misunderstandings. And I think looking back on it, an anxious six can really seem like a wet blanket to a three who wants to get on. You know, I mean, my intention was, haven't you thought of this? You know, I want to make it a success for you, you but in an anxious way. So... Um, yeah, so we, we met the Enneagram and he just introduced it to his company and they were all talking outside the pub on an October okay. evening and suddenly I was having really meaningful conversations with people and I thought this is so much more interesting than hearing about your new car or your holiday. <laughs> uh, we began to see how it could help us and we went to all sorts of courses in the UK that we could do. Mm-hmm. So there was a, uh, a mayor's house in Bristol was a wonderful place for Enneagram trainings. Mm. We did everything we could. And then we went to the States. My intention in going there was just to experience being with Helen Palmer and David Daniels and understanding the narrative tradition. But we did do two weeks, well, two six day trainings back to back uh, because we were there. So it was it was quite full on and it was life changing. Mm. I came away thinking, no, I want to go further. I want to certify. I remember hearing from a a nine on that course who said, because I know the Enneagram and now because I know my type, I remember to take my medication and I don't forget myself. And I thought, if this saves lives, I really want to know about it. Mm -hmm. And it was already making our relationship so much happier and so much more fun because Mm -hmm. it didn't take things so personally. So I qualified and then we got the Americans to come over here because not everyone can go to the States. Mm -hmm. 
you know, Paul being more entrepreneurial, he got bums on seats <laughs> and I did the marketing and everything. Um, and we did that for, well, 2008 was the last one. Mm. By then there was the financial crisis and it was difficult and the exchange rate and it made it very expensive. So meanwhile, I'd, we'd done a training and somebody had a psychotic episode. Mm. And I thought, oh, I'm, I might need more models than just this one. Yeah. So I went to study psychotherapy and I thought, well, I'll get a certificate. Mm -hmm. And then that wasn't good enough. So I got a diploma yeah. and then I uh, did the master's, might as well. Uh, and, then, and then the couple course and uh, supervision. And then I thought, well, now we really do have to have um, training in England for English speakers in Europe, really. And uh, the Americans were still keen to come over, but I was looking across the, to Europe and seeing the Dutch had a training and the Germans and the French and the Finns and the Czechs. Why can't we have one? Yes, we speak the same language as the Americans, but not quite. Yeah. So anyway, we, we uh, took the Dutch training or we, we asked Jeanette van Stein to come over and give us her training which was a translation of the American training, but with improvements. Mm -hmm. She's a wonderful type one. And so that's the training we, ad we adopted. And um, she helped us to deliver that for three or four years. And then in 2017, Heather Brown and I mm. thought, right, well, we'll take over. Mm -hmm. So we offer a professional qualification in the UK. Mm -hmm. um, and it will shortly have a training in Ireland as well. And that's in the narrative Enneagram tradition. That's in the narrative tradition, mm -hmm. yes. And you, you do the foundation and then you can learn how to help people find their type. And then you can go on and learn how to be a panel facilitator and run workshops. And we've also just got a one-to-one a, a one training for coaches and counsellors. Mm -hmm. So relationships. I'd like to get some definitions going. What is love? What is an authentic relationship? And what is the purpose of a relationship from the spiritual perspective. Right. Okay. Well, now you're asking. <laughs> I know, I know. I'm, blowing, I'm throwing it all at so, you. Well, love, the word in English, just four little letters, mm. and it's so loaded with meaning mm. um, from fondness, one end to, to sex at the other, and all kinds of compassion and everything in between. Mm. The Greeks have four words for love. And I think they really break it down so philia is the sort of deep connection between friends. And I think that's an important part of relationship, yeah. you know, to actually like your partner mm. as a friend. Mm -hmm. um, and then, of course, there's eros, which is, you know, sexy, passionate love. Um, and then there's storge, which is like compassion, empathy, caring, you know, the kind of love that you have in a family. Mm. And then there's agape which is that unconditional love. You know, it's often compared to God's fatherly love. It's mm. selfless. Okay, quite, quite different yeah. forms of love. So, authentic relationship. It's interesting, my first response to yeah. that was, it's interesting that you slipped the word authentic yeah. in. Yeah, it is, isn't it? You know, it, maybe it's coming from a type bias. Yeah. And, and I was thinking, well, what would I have, would I have asked about a trusting relationship? Mm coming from a sixth perspective mm. and then Paul my husband a three you know a successful relationship yeah. um, so but I think what it draws out is that in the first instance we are all looking for something different mm. yeah. and so we misunderstand each other mm -hmm. but actually I think when we start to work on our relationship that's when we get to the authentic part mm. but in the beginning it's particularly if we don't have any models, if we don't have the Enneagram or MBTI or NLP, for instance, or even understanding different love languages, mm. anything that tells people that they're actually different yeah. and that's okay, it makes people feel that, well, what's the matter with you? Why, you know, why don't you want what I want? Why don't you give me what I want? Mm. You should know in some sort of magical way what will make me happy. And our partner doesn't because... Even if they're the same type, they've probably got a different wing or their, their upbringing or their gender. They just, we just don't know really what the other is looking for. Mm. Alain de Botton, mm. you know, the Swiss philosopher. Yeah. Yes. Well, he's a bit pessimistic. He's written yeah. something. Actually, he's written such a Well, he says, why we always marry the wrong person. 
Okay, so he says that when we learn about love, we learn it in the family as small children. And we get it very confused with everything else that's going on. So it might be that we have a, a parent who's out of control and we, you know, we feel that we have to help them with their addictions or whatever it is. Or, you know, maybe we're afraid of, of our father's anger or, you know, we feel that we can't communicate what we need. Mm. And all of that, that gets a little bit confused with love mm. so that we might meet someone who actually could give us true love but they're too right, they're, they're too balanced, they're too mature. They're too... Mm. <laughs> then, and what we look for is familiarity. Mm. Ah, this feels like what love felt like when I was small. Mm -hmm. And then, of course, what, when, if you bring the spiritual dimension to that, it is that unconsciously we're looking to heal those wounds mm. from our childhood. Mm -hmm. And the other person will trigger in us all of those wounds there's a there's a very lovely quote um that I'd, I'd like to share you probably know it Daphne Rose Kingma love is the crucible and she says through love we're invited to resolve our histories love is the crucible the unmeltable changeless container in which we are tested by fire melted down and transformed in love, we are formed and reformed by the white heat of the unexpected revisitation of all the things in us that cry out to be healed. Our shame and fear, our hurts and insecurities, our conflicts and our endless inner controversies. Through our beloved, we are once again brought face to face with what is unresolved in us. We meet again our father's absence or our brother's envy, our mother's cruelty or our sister's competition. We see our own childhoods mirrored in every direction. And through love, we're invited to re-enter them again, but differently, to re-experience and grieve the losses of the past and thus to redeem them. So lovely. I do um, experience that the relationships have been places for healing, um, but you've got to have some, <laughs> it takes a lot of capacity on, on both people's part to wade through that and survive it and go through all of the various uh, breakages yeah yes it does and because you I know you want to ask me about you know what what are, what are the essential things mm. and um I love the work of Professor John Gottman yeah I mean he is now a couples therapist but he was originally a couples researcher and so he says that you know whenever he had a theory he would go out and it would be proven wrong. And, you know, that's a real scientist. Mm. But what he recognised was that even when we're arguing, we need to have five times as much positive mm. the one negative. And when we're not arguing, 20 times. I know. And so what that does is it, it kind of fills up your love bank account mm. so that when there's a problem that you need to talk about, or you get a big gas bill, or there's a war in Ukraine, or so, you know, all kinds of everything that comes into the relationship from the outside that we have no control over, mm -hmm. that's upsetting and negative. That's draining our love tanks all the time. Mm -hmm. So as a, you know, a couple needs to keep putting in the good times, the positivity, the appreciation, mm -hmm. you know, the kindness, those four different kinds of love so that there's that resilience yeah. just recently I, I had a couple come to see me and you know he's a head type mm. so he really wanted to get to the bottom of their latest argument oh. you know and and he said we have to do this and i say no we do not have to do this what we have to do is remember what you love about her mm. and she remembered what she loved about him and immediately that starts to repair the relationship. And then in a sense, it doesn't matter mm. that he, you know, she sent too many texts or he didn't, whatever, that, you know, that that's another model I share, the problem A and problem B. The problem A is what we think we're arguing about, who left the toilet seat up, all that stuff. But the reason we're arguing about it is because problem B, the relationship, is not in a good place. If it's in a good place, we can put on our rose-tinted spectacles and think, 
oh, that toilet seat again, he forgets. But when we're in a bad place, then that becomes yet another way in which you don't care about me. Yeah, it's never about the um, presenting issue. No, issue. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> What's fundamental to a healthy relationship? You've already sort of named a few things, actually. What would you say? Yes. Well, I, I mean, the first thing to say is I think a lot of time together. You know, relationships thrive on giving time and attention to each other. Mm-hmm. And um, I get very worried when I have couples who lead parallel lives, mm. you know, and don't really connect, don't know what the other one's doing. Uh, it's... Um, it's not a good sign, really. The other strange thing that's happening now that we have, well, I've been doing sessions on Zoom since the pandemic. I'm looking forward, ne- you know, in, actually next week oh, to going back to my counselling room. Yeah. Uh, couples will call in from different places. And whereas I'm used to having them sitting together on a sofa in my counselling room, uh, where I can see the dance between them and, you know, whether they turn towards each other or turn away or whether they roll their eyes, which is really bad sign that kind of thing yeah um but when they're in different places i find it's a bit like trying to well i've never driven a team of horses but <laughs> i can imagine you know one horse being faster than the other or I mean, it's very difficult so i've taken to saying to couples now no you have to be in the same room otherwise i don't think the work goes well yeah i mean yeah. if you can't Wasting even money. commit to being in the same time and space for the duration of a counselling session it doesn't bode well does it no I mean you have to be flexible of course if you know one of them has to travel or something yeah but um the majority of the sessions need to be together it's so interesting that you name that one because there's such a culture these days of having independence and having your own life yes and and not that you can't have your passion projects Mm. but you know to have someone to share them with you or to even even if then you know maybe you're not terribly interested in his football yeah, or whatever it is exactly. but he can talk about it yeah uh, and enthuse about it and you can be somehow carried it along with it mm. um, then then that builds you know the, that, those positive interactions and that sense of understanding and having someone who can share things with you mm-hmm. and then you know how much more resilient one can be when there is somebody else at home to hear your gripe about you know yeah. what the boss said and then you you know can get over it and yes the advice is for the, the other person not to fix you you have to have the opportunity to complain and then afterwards maybe to mention that it's something that you might think of but as, as long as your partner never sides with the enemy mm-hmm. the bad boss mm-hmm. because that doesn't yeah, yeah. I, I was think I would feel quite hurt if that were, I was on the receiving end of that but um, you know this yes. not fixing thing do, is that more of a male tendency in your observation to be, yeah. there's often the pattern that the the female wants to, to connect yeah so her conversation is really about connecting mm-hmm. and then he says well what you ought to do is this this and this which of course she knows what she ought to do mm-hmm. And she feels a bit um, dismissed. Yeah. But his his answer is, well, why is she telling me if she doesn't want me, me to help? Um, so sometimes just even teaching a couple that one mm. is really helpful. I do do a lot of um, psych ed, particularly when couples come and, you know, they think they're a bit abnormal. Yeah. You know, we're not getting on together. Well, who does? Yeah, you know? exactly. Um, that's fine. Mm. But I think they often think that coming to counselling is the end of the road, almost. Mm. Yeah, that that is a real paradigm shift we could all do with. Even in our um, our personal psychotherapy work, it's preventative, right? It doesn't have to be yes. like... Yeah. And in fact, I have couples who come, they're usually people who know the Enneagram, actually. Oh. And they say, can we come for an MOT? <laughs> yeah, I love that. When is couples counselling effective and when is it less so, Rosemary, in your observation? Well, I, I kind of feel like I haven't finished answering Oh, I'm question. so sorry. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> I've jumped ahead. We're still delving into what's fundamental to a healthy relationship. So we have... Time together. Yeah. Yes. Five to one positive, uh, even when you're arguing. Although 
even more if you can if you can do that. Mm. There's a wonderful video that uh, John Gottman has of a couple, and they're actually having an argument about a telephone bill. He describes them as the masters of relationship because they do it so nicely. <laughs> He's really worried about how much money is being spent on the phone bill. Mm -hmm. And she's saying, but I need to talk to my mother and sisters and my friends. And he says, you know, yeah, I know, honey, I get that. And they're, they're together, they're... They're kind of negotiating, then they have a giggle about something, you know, in the conversation she had with her mother. And then they go back to, yeah, but this bill, you know. <laughs> but they're just so gentle about it. I mean, that is a, a, a tip. Anything you need to bring, and you do need to, it, it, it's not just five positive and no negative. No, you know, every relationship needs to have a clear out and, a, you know, whatever is bothering you. Mm. But whatever it is, you bring it up gently so that the other person doesn't get defensive yeah. and then they feel like they're in a war and before you know it, uh, it's a slanging match mm. and doors are banged and, you know, it can get very quickly too much. So start gently yeah. and, and stay gentle. Um, yes, curiosity about what's going on and, and who each other is and, and compassion for that mm -hmm. as well. There's not, not much role for, for judgment mm -hmm. or um, constructive criticism. <laughs> I'm thinking about any round one when I think of constructive criticism because that can be a real way that they give love, right? I've been in a relationship with a one and it's love. Yeah, well, exactly. There is also, yes, if you know that, you can try and reframe yeah. their... Because <laughs> so they're trying to improve. Mm. And the more, they, the more they love you, the more they try to improve you, of course. Yeah. Um, so, yeah. And I do think um, holding it lightly and and having a laugh about those kind of things really helps. Yes, I, I'm seeing a couple at that moment, um, and he's a one, and uh, I sent them some information, and she wrote back to say thank you. Mm. And he will have the, all of that information laminated by the end of the week. <laughs> oh, my God. So she, she's got the idea that, you know, yeah. he does everything very thoroughly and... Yeah, I love this about really? one. I love it. <laughs> yes. <laughs> it's so lovely. Exactly. Um, so they do work so hard. Mm. Yeah. What else? Anything else on the list? Um, well, I, I've got wearing our rose tinted spectacles about the other person. Mm. Just knowing that they're doing their best. They just might be a bit slow or a bit distracted or thoughtless. I'd like to know what aspects of the Enneagram are making the biggest impact when we come into relationship with someone. So, well, I think that it's, um, it's type for sure. Mm -hmm. And I think subtype also, you know, the instinctual subtype plays a huge role. And, um, and I find with, uh, with couples, I may not be able to be sure of the type, mm -hmm. Certainly not without doing a typing interview. But subtype is usually very clear. Mm. Or, and we can talk about the difference. And the, and the chances are your partner won't be the same subtype. Yeah. If you think of the relationship as being, I sometimes think of it as like a yin and yang model. It's a beautiful complementarity mm. within the, that beautiful um sort of rounded model which makes the relationship so whole and integrated mm. there's a stress because actually you're different yeah. so yes you know a self-preservation and a social couple will cover more of the um the needs mm -hmm. in the world mm -hmm. but within that couple there'll be such a lot of misunderstanding you know yeah i mean it amounts to a completely different set of values doesn't it especially when maybe the, the instinct you're leading with is the one that your partner is blind in, right? Totally. And it's often that's the way. It's like unconsciously you've chosen someone who will do that for you. Yeah. You know, I hate looking at bank accounts. Oh, I'm so glad you're going to check how much money is in the bank every week. And then it becomes like, oh, do you know, do you have nothing else to do but check the bank account? Yeah. <laughs> that's interesting of itself. I mean, the, um, the instinct yes. preferences are probably formed in the early 
early childhood development. Do you think that, Rosemary? I've heard that anyway, definitely. Yes, yeah. I do think so. And I've often felt guilty as a social myself. I've got, I have two self-preservation daughters mm. and a social daughter. Mm. And um, I'm sure the self press girls looked in the fridge and didn't see <laughs> as much as they should have been. I mean, of course, the instincts can change yeah. a bit. So that, you know, when we fall in love, we're, we're all one-to-one, even if that's not our dominant subtype and uh, you know equally when the, the kids come along we'll be more in our self-preservation uh, mode mm. but um, we will revert to whatever the dominant but I think a, a lovely piece of work is to work on your neglected subtype yeah. that's the one that's just so boring yeah. actually so so important <laughs> and it's all about balance is this something mm. you tend to teach the couples that come in especially when it's clear that a subtype clash is causing conflict i don't tend to teach that to couples no, actually no, that's no. more of the advanced training yeah but i do i mean i will talk about subtype mm-hmm. and they get it even if they don't know the enneagram yeah uh, and then they can have more understanding i don't think i've ever got around to talking about balancing it more but i do try to make them see the benefit of the other what that great you know that the other person is complimenting them rather than I mean, it is quite obvious when you've got a set of priorities that revolve around self-preservation and a set of priorities that revolve around social. Most couples would be aware, I feel, that, that, that that's the case without having to slap the Enneagram on them. Um, yeah. Yes. So we have the instinctual aspect of the Enneagram, type. And can we say more about the different ways that the body types, heart types and the mental types tend to be in relationships? Uh, that is another area that I can teach a couple about without necessarily touching on the Enneagram mm-hmm. and, and the Enneagram types. Yeah. Um, because of that, you know, that longing for connection that the heart types all have and, and you know, appreciation and recognition. And, you know, how are we together? Uh, and then, you know, the classically, they might be with a head type who's like, you know, fearful of uh, invasion or, or, you know, what, what are you going to do next? Or are you going to trap me? Mm-hmm. And just understanding that really, you know, it's because of the, the love and the longing to be connected mm-hmm. that a heart type might, you know, come on closer to you. And if you're a, you know, five, for instance, you find that intrusive. But actually understanding that um, the more you withdraw, the more they're going to come out after you. Because, well, I, I said to somebody the other day, you know, this beautiful woman wants to be in touch with you. Don't see it as intrusion. See it as a lovely thing. Yeah, yeah. There's a kind of rhythmicity to the, uh, the body types. Mm. And, uh, you know, they all have an underlying, um, well, we could call it anger, but it is about wanting the world to be the way it should be. Mm. You know, why can't we all be harmonious or why isn't it fair or, you know, it should be ethical and kind of uh, appreciating that and the way they make things happen. It's a great, you know, seeing all the great qualities of what the different type uh, centres bring. Yeah. I'm trying to think whether I've, I don't, I think I've mostly been with body types with nines and ones and then, Hmm. It is quite a different way of being, is it, uh, from from a heart type? But there's a lot that's complementary, actually, about going with a partner in a different centre. Any type combination could be good or hell, right? Yes. Two fours might be a challenge. It would take a lot for me to get into a relationship with another four. But when the, the people are of the same type, they tend to lean on a wing. At least that's my experience. That's interesting. Of course, when you when they each know each other's type, yeah. my um, couple's work just goes so much more quickly, so much more profound. You can you can feel in the room the compassion, and there'll be tears, and it's very moving, really. Mm. I I love it when couples come because they know their types yeah. and they want to work on it. So that's very special. Yes, as you say, any combination can work, and they're often each other's stress point which is another element that 
that comes in, you know, because it's called stress, but yeah. actually it's just another resource. The type's done the best it can, yeah. and now it, it needs another uh, different characteristics to deal with the situation. Yeah, I love that way of putting it, actually. Yeah, just different mm-hmm. resources that the partner is usually maybe embodying or modelling in some way. Mm. Yes, exactly. I'm curious to know, when the intervention doesn't work or it isn't effective, does that generally happen because the relationship is beyond repair or...? Well, I mean, I have not very often, but I have had people come to my counselling room just so that, you know, one of them can hear with a witness the other one say, I don't want to be in this relationship anymore. Wow, really? And that's... You know, it's not my job. I don't see it's my job to keep people together. No. If they, they're not. That's not working. They're not happy. Mm. I do remember working with a with a couple, and I couldn't understand the dynamic because it seemed to be working, and then the next week they come back, and it wasn't. And I just happened to be taking a shortcut through um, through a back alley, mm-hmm. and uh, I saw her come out of an establishment. Mm. holding hands with someone who wasn't him and I thought oh yeah you <laughs> that <know."> makes sense <laughs> there were three people mm. in that relationship so you know there need there does need to be commitment mm. and trust mm, mm, mm. and that they really that's really what they what they want mm-hmm. for it to go forward together and I I don't want to see more than one argument in my counseling room mm. I, I'm much more directive than I am with when I see my individual clients. Mm. So I will stop them. Really? Because I think they're wasting their time and money. They can do that outside of the counseling room. When, <laughs> and once I've seen one argument, I've probably seen all of them because yeah. that's the same old thing that gets around and around. <laughs> so, like no, we're not having that. Um, but trying to see what's behind um, maybe an angry, rageful comment, mm. you know, that actually there's a, there's a huge need to make to get the other person to hear. And why is that so important? Well, because because the other person's important to me, even though my arms are akimbo and I'm screaming at them. Mm-hmm. Ah, relationships, the fun. I know. They're so rich, aren't they? I love, I'm not in a relationship at the moment, but in a romantic relationship, but I do love the growth that happens inside romantic relationships. It's so precious. Well, yes, it's often compared to the grit in the oyster. I like that. I don't think relationships are meant to be easy and fun all of the time, but again, that's probably my type bias, and um, not everyone would necessarily feel that way, I guess. No, but I think that's a blessing of the four, that they don't mind mucking it out. Scraping the bottom of the barrel, (laughs) Yeah. yeah. I, is there anything that I've missed or not not asked you about through my haphazardness? Ask me, is it often enough for one person to do the work? Yes. To change. And I actually, I do feel that each person needs to do their own work. Mm. Partly because if, you know, if you end up being the partner, the only partner who's doing work, you can get resentful. But then it may be possible to invite the other person mm. to think about what they do, you know, with that, with that lovely um, phrase, you know, very gently, mm. I notice when you, I feel, and I would like you to, you know, mm. and you say, you fill in the blanks. So, yeah, I mean, I did actually have a couple once, I think they only came a couple of times. Um, and it was really very sweet because um, what was happening was he was leaving his dirty sports kit all over the house. And this was making her feel like some sort of servant. Yeah. And anyway, she said, so I'm just, you know, when he comes home, I'm, I'm watching the telly, aren't I? I'm not, I'm not going to prepare supper. And he was sort of, why are you cooking on the yeah. supper, you know? Because like, that was all part of her being a servant. Yeah. So when we talked about this and he heard that this was upsetting, well, the next week, it turned out he put his sports kit in the wash, laundry basket, whatever. Yeah. And she said, I just suddenly felt like I wanted to do something nice for him. And the whole thing was reversed. Wow. So it just takes bringing awareness to these things that are having such a big impact on our partners, right? That we're not aware of them. Leaving your dirty laundry around and the person interpreting that as 
uh, disrespectful in some way. I mean, those are two different things, aren't they? Absolutely. And, and I mean, actually, you can um, tr- train your partner mm. a bit. Mm. So you don't nag. But, you know, ignoring behaviour you don't like. Trying to encourage behaviour you do like. And, and I often think of the psychology class, you know, who trained their professor to stand on the left-hand side of the room. And he's their professor... And he didn't realise that, so every time he went to the right, and they didn't pay any attention. And so by the end of term, he knew, all unconsciously, that he had to stand on the left because then they would all look at him with undivided attention. So I love that. Ignore the stuff that's annoying or frustrating and sort of amplify the stuff that's good. I like that a lot. I had a quick, this question around key practices, but you've named them plenty, actually, in this interview. Is there, is there any that we didn't get to? I rather like the love languages. Do you know them? I do. Gary Chapman's um, framework. I like that. Yes. And then, of course, I learnt the Enneagram, and that because I I feel like the um, the head types, heart types, and body types will lend themselves to a sort of love language. I kind of like yes. threw out Chapman's model because it seems so simple, but it is that. It, it is yeah. simple. It's like you know, if we're talking about relationships, it's an easy quiz to do. Yeah. And it's, uh, you know, and it's all part of reinforcing the fact that we're different. That's true, yeah. You know, to one person, yes, physical contact is, feels wonderful. The other person, that really isn't their love language. Mm. Um, and, uh, you know, yes, they'd like them for a gift. Thank you very much. Yeah. Um, but at least if you're talking about it. Yeah. That's a kind of profound contribution to the to relationships that he made with that model. Uh, many people are aware of it, right? Yes, yeah. absolutely. I suppose the only other thing I, I really love, <laughs> and I guess, and maybe this is coming from my time, but perhaps it's a bit pessimistic, but John Gottman studied uh, couples. Yeah. And then years later, he went back to see how they were doing. Mm-hmm. And again, years, and they were still having the same arguments. Mm. And he came to the conclusion that only 31% of our problems are solvable. The other 69% mm. come from, yes, our, our upbringing, our Enneagram type, our culture, whatever. And they're parts of ourselves that we, we, couldn't, we can't change. He says we couldn't change them any more than we could give each other our bones. Yeah. We might want to, we just can't. It's reassuring somehow. Isn't it? Yeah. Yeah. The thing is not to get involved in having big arguments about those issues. Mm. He does this two fists together, mm. banging, um, because you're you're on a hiding to nothing. You're you're in gridlock then. But if you can always be dialoguing and gently talking, what he says is, and it's lovely when the two fists are together. It's because inside those fists is a dream. Mm. He opens his hands out like a you know, that's dreams are flying out. And that's one of the reasons they can't, you know, you can't give up on a, on a dream. Yeah. For his four horsemen, which I'm sure you use, do you use those a lot oh, as yes, well? Yeah. Yes. Criticism, defensiveness, contempt and stonewalling. Mm, gosh, even the yeah. hearing them makes me feel a bit funny he's another one obviously that anyone that cares about their relationships should be aware of well he says if those four aspects are in a relationship it's not a good sign and they you know that's where you want to reverse Mm. reverse those Mm. Mm. and thank you so much for your time conversation is with Enneagram teacher and integral coach Josh Levine. We're going to be talking about listening. 